and essential to understand how to practice spiritual life in this age. There are many, when we say, bona fide gurus, and there are many who are not of that caliber. But then amongst the bona fide ones, those who actually glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead as the principal presentation of their bhakya, their speech and uh, talk, actually have the insight of what is real spirituality. You see, the Prabhupada would like to speak about his growing up in Calcutta back in the the early 1900s. Also, his time growing up, being in college, being a father of Gandhi for many years, and then in 1922, meeting his spiritual master in Calcutta, which planted the seed of his mission. At that time, he's told him that you were a very intelligent young man. You should take this message of Lord Chaitanya all around the Western world. And when he heard that, he wasn't in a position to understand how to do that, although he was inspired by the instruction. And he thought, I'll do it in India. And so, of course, Dilipalpa was married and had five children. And uh, he was destined, according to an astrologer, to be one of the richest men in India on the level of Bhira. And he was moving in that direction. He had become a, a chief pharmacist in a, in a pharmaceutical company, Jagadish Chandra Bose's pharmaceutical company. And uh, Prabhupada was also getting some of the uh, invitations from the, some of the best chemical companies in India to take over the operation. They understood his qualities, Bengal Chemical, and many others. And Prabhupada was becoming more and more known for his uh, activities in the pharmaceutical business. And he was also making his own medicines too. So if you want to know about medicine, Mr. Prabhupada, <laughs> he was also an expert in that area also, because that was his background. But he talks about himself in various ways, how he eventually uh, left everything, joined his uh, spiritual master's entourage. And uh, although he wasn't active within the entourage, he was uh, preaching on his own at the the spiritual master left the planet in 1936 it was actually January 1st, 1937. Ashila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati left the planet, and just a few weeks prior to that, he had met the spiritual master. And Bhakti Siddhanta re emphasized what he told him in 1922 you take this mission to the Western world. The problem I was thinking, I have to get some money, I have to get some notoriety before I can actually do that. So he made great efforts to preach in India. And he, fortunately, he got a few uh, opportunities, one place in near Delhi called Jhansi. He opened up a kind of a, like an ashram there, yeah. and he started to talk about Krishna consciousness and two people were coming to his meetings and others. And uh, but after some time he lost that building because the governor's wife in the area she wanted that first woman sewing club. <laughs> so she had the power because she was the wife of the governor. So she wanted that building and Papa had, had to give it up because the, under the pressure of the political area. So everything he tried to do in India, as far as preaching Krishna consciousness, really didn't flourish at all. It was only when he really finally understood that I have to go to the West. 
And this is the instructions of my spiritual master. And he came. He had nothing. He talks about it. I had, he had seven rupees. No, I'm sorry, 40 rupees. 40 rupees when he left India. And 40 rupees, I guess, in those days was maybe like $40. Rupee was much more valuable, you know, then. And on an ocean liner, he crossed the ocean, took him 39 days. He had two heart attacks. Uh, and then he had a third one after being in America for about a year and a half in 1967. So he had undergone great austerities in order to actually just reach the West, what to speak of the difficulties he had in teaching in the West. And he wasn't getting in any encouragement from anyone. His, uh, he would write to his, all of his god brothers in India to give him some support. He said, we may we can open a temple in New York City. But they, they only supported in words only. He said, yeah, it's very nice what you're doing, but they never gave any man no more money or anything. But Brahman was pretty much not pretty much completely on his own. But he had one thing. He had faith in Krishna and he had faith in the instructions of the spiritual master. And so he persevered. And of course, eventually wound up in a very obscure place in New York City, which is known as the Bowery, a place where derelicts and various types of people who were outcasts in society were living. And there was also at that time what is called the hippie culture, which was quite prominent. In those days, um, there was a large movement to reject everything that was given to us by our parents, the whole lifestyle, the, all the values, and simply do your own thing. <laughs> do your own thing and so there was this movement of what we call hippies someone asked Sula Papa what is a hippie Papa said something very extraordinary <laughs> in other words he couldn't give a definition <laughs> and one time he was asked the same question he said you know better than I <laughs> Well, people had no, no, what we say, what's the word, no goal in life, but to enjoy as much as they could sense gratification, get, us, get intoxicated on all kinds of substances, get into music and read books on Eastern philosophy. When that reading of the books of the Eastern philosophy was an asset because of when they met Prabhupada, they, they thought they had found someone who would really be a representative of what they were reading. And of course, he was. So I think it's a long history. But just to go back a little bit, um, Srila Prabhupada, when he was, uh, um, he was talking to one of his uh, leading sannyasis at the time this when uh, this is after he had established his movement in america and one of the characteristics and qualities about Srila Prabhupada, he was always talking about krishna when we were with him or he was always talking about ideas on how to spread krishna consciousness he was never quiet he was always turning new ideas how to you know, print books, distribute books, how to, how to, you know, reach people with this message of Lord Chaitanya. And this was Srila Prabhupada. One time, but this time he was very quiet and he was being massaged by his, um, his devotee. And uh, Prabhupada wasn't saying anything for quite a long time. And then at one time, it was mystical, as is described by this dear devotee. I was there when he described it. We had a meeting many years ago in Bhakti Chirusvami's room in Mayapur, where about a hundred Prabhupada disciples came to speak about Srila Prabhupada. 
And this devotee was telling this experience he had with Prabhupada. It was quite mystical. And Prabhupada broke the silence after a long time. And he said, I was with Krishna in the spiritual world. And Krishna told me, come to the material world and preach. Yeah, and then I said to Krishna, material world? I didn't want to go. But then Krishna said to me, No, you go. You write some books and I'll protect you. So yeah. I came. <laughs> so the way this, this the story was transmitted was really in the whole room just became filled with this energy when this body was talking about that when this wasn't there before. Uh, Siddha Prabhupada is called what is called a Nitya Siddha, uh, a person who is an eternal associate of the spiritual world, who has no business in this world. But when Krishna wants to spread the mission, Sometimes he empowers people in this world to do the work, and sometimes he sends others to do the work, or sometimes he comes himself. And this time, he asked his soul, who was an intimate associate of him, who we know in this world as Sri Prabhupada, to come and do this work. And Prabhupada was quite amazing. It's also mentioned in one Purana. It's called the Brahmanda Purana, that Krishna speaking, the words are these words are written, and these are words of Krishna. Krishna is speaking, he said, in 5,000 years, there will become, there will come a personality who will appear in this world. He will be the mantra upasaka, the person who spreads the mantra everywhere. And he will take my name everywhere around the world. And that was spoken, was written more than 5,000 years ago. It was read at least then, even before then. So Prabhupada's appearance in the world was not something that was just happened. It was Krishna's plan to give the mother world this mercy of pure spirituality. Vaishnav culture in its best form. And you can see, because Srila Prabhupada proved to the world that it's not just for India. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prima Sarupa Bhunai Shravanadi Siddhi Chinte Kodiya Vidai. In the hearts of all living entities, pure love for Krishna is there. It's not something you bring from the outside, it's not something you create. It's something you uncovered. So all living entities and all species of life, not only human lives, but to speak about, you know, different types of human life, but even below that, 8,400,000 categories of living entities, and each, each category is a pure spiritual being, even down to the smallest light insect, which you can't even see, you call the Indra is also a pure soul. Each one of these souls are, they have pure love for Krishna. But by the body they have, they are covered. But only in the human form of life can that uncovering happen. And therefore this movement of spirituality is meant to do, to awaken that, that uncovering. It's not about not about making a nice material arrangement and it's about coming back to the Lord in the spiritual world and pure loving devotional service as the goal of life. And so that that prediction was there by Krishna five thousand years ago. And then when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is Krishna himself, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Radha Krishna Narayanya. He is not only Krishna, but he is in the mood of his internal energy, Srimati Radharani. Lord Chaitanya is the most mysterious incarnation of the Lord. He cannot be described simply by words, 
but he uh, he is God himself who plays the role of a devotee of God to teach from the position of the teacher, the student, how to worship the Supreme Personality of God. And his example in life is the, uh, what we say, the epitome, or the, the best example on how to serve the Supreme Lord. Prabhupada would say, when the teacher takes the position of the student, he teaches the student from that position, that, that is the ideal teaching. That's Sri Chaitanya Mahatma. And he lived it. You know, he also spoke it, but he also lived it. And so there is a dialogue between Sri Narada Muni, the great saint, and Lord Chaitanya. And Lord Chaitanya is telling Narada Muni, soon my mantra upasika, no, I'm sorry, my sanapati bhakta, sanapati bhakta, will appear in this world and he will, he will bring Krishna consciousness everywhere. He will bring my, my message everywhere. So sanapati means general. The best of all bhaktas. And that again refers to the uh, Srila Prabhupada, who is destined to come to do this work. A third prediction was given by Srila Bhakti Vinodakla, one of the great acharyas in the Vaishnava culture. And he also said, soon, this was in the early 1900s, a great personality will appear in this world and take Lord Chaitanya's message all around the world. So Srila Prabhupada is not just some <laughs> great saint who somehow really got lucky <laughs> and somehow opened up so many temples. He is actually a manifestation of the Lord's mercy coming in this world at a very critical time in the history of humankind when people are moving away from spirituality towards materialism. And this moving away has really developed within the last 300 years. Started what's called the Industrial Revolution, <laughs> trying to modernize life in such a way that people would be more and more dependent on machines and less dependent on nature, more and more dependent on <clears throat> government policies and less dependent on each other. And over these last 200 to 250, 300 years, the world has come into a critical crisis. And we can see that even today or not. And at any time, there could be a major war. Major war, not just a small thing. And Prabhupada was, I don't want to sound fatalistic, <laughs> but. Prabhupada was giving a lecture, and he was discussing, it was more like a discussion with his, uh, his devotees. And Prabhupada was talking about um, how people are, uh, have lost their human qualities and their behavior is more like animals. And then they were discussing the point of even farther. You know, one person said, well, what about a terrorist? Well, was it a bigger animal? <laughs> <laughs> then they started to get into discussing about weaponry in the world, and they started asking Prabhupada about the nuclear weapon. And one devotee was saying, well, they have the nuclear weapons nowadays, but many countries have it, so each country is afraid of the other country, so they won't use it. It's called the, the, the balance of fear, right? Because if I have the big weapon and you have the big weapon, if I use it, you smash me and I smash you and then nobody wins. <laughs> that was the logic. But Prabhupada shot that whole logic down. He said, he said if they create it, they will use it. Mm -hmm. The fact that they create it, it will be used in due course of time. Just like in World War II, they used the atomic bomb. The war was over, <laughs> but they had to use it anyway. They dropped it on Nagasaki and Hiroshima and killed hundreds of thousands of people in Japan, although Japan had already surrendered. So when they have these bombs, they, they want to use them. They find different ways to think of how to use them. So Prabhupada came at a time when the world was in a very critical situation, not only warlike, but just 
how people's lifestyles have become more and more dysfunctional and away from nature. Uh, people used to live according to uh, the seasons and more dependent on nature, more of a simple lifestyle, which was the history of the world for thousands and thousands of years. It's only these last 300 years that we now have to plug everything into the wall, push buttons. Uh, we have cars that drive by themselves. But it, so everything now is automation and, and uh, it's putting more and more people out of employment and people are looking the other way. So it's somewhat of a, a separation between God and man and nature, all because of this highly technological industrial society. So Prabhupada came at that time to bring everything back. That was Krishna's right. So people would ask, well, why did you come when you came? Or why didn't you come early? <laughs> they asked him, Prabhupada said, you weren't ready for me then. <laughs> And he came at the time when people were actually questioning the values of uh, you know Western culture and the whole lifestyle along with it. And Prabhupada presented not only spirituality but a lifestyle which was conducive to what uh, we say practicing spirituality and living according to what we say God's arrangement for nature and for man. So Srila Prabhupada was an interesting person. Those who had association with him will never forget that association, even if it was for a moment. Prabhupada was asked one time, he said, someone asked him, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he took Krishna consciousness and he spread it all over the Indian subcontinent. When Mahaprabhu was there, when he was in Jagannath Puri, when at the age of 24, after he had taken the sannyas order, he went on an excursion and he went down the eastern side of India, all the way down to Cape Cormoran, came back up the western side. And when he got to Mumbai, he crossed over and went back towards Jagannath Puri. It took him six full years. And when he was traveling, he was spreading the, the Hare Krishna mantra everywhere. Everywhere he went, thousands and thousands of people would join him and he would simply chant and dance. And there was mass kirtans all around the world, all, all around India. So. And people were uh, actually in, in getting the real taste of the Vedic culture. And practically, Lord Chaitanya made India fully Krishna conscious at that time, at least in many parts of India. And so the devotees had asked to the Prabhupada when he came to the West and he had his Western disciples. Lord Chaitanya, he took Krishna consciousness all over India. And he's God. Why didn't he why didn't he come to the West and do the same thing? Good question. And he was here and he, uh, he showed his power in India. And Prabhupada said he left it for me to do. Very well. <laughs> He wants to give credit to his devotees, and so he empowers his devotees to do the work, his, his homework, that he could do automatically. But that doesn't really solve the problem. The solve problem is that he wants the devotees to take the opportunity to, to, take, to do the work that he wants to do until they can get the credit and also become purified and achieve the spiritual realm. That's Krishna. <laughs> like that. So, and this is a feature of Krishna's nature is that he's all powerful. And one time somebody asked Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada was in London. He was meeting very important people at the time. He had asked his secretary, Sham Sundar, you know, I'm here in London for three, about three more months. I want to meet many important people bring them to me. So Shama Sundar was good at meeting people. He's the one that met the Beatles. And so he was meeting poets and authors, musicians, and people who had positions in society. 
So when there was one group that came, they were called the Mensa Society, M E N S A Mensa, and their their program was to pick philosophical topics from the different scriptures or from just from topics that worldly people are interested in and discuss it. They were armchair intellectuals. Pick a topic and just discuss it, try to understand it from different angles of vision. And so they were known as a Mensa Society, discussing, discussing, discussing. So Prabhupada met them, and Prabhupada was talking about how Krishna is all powerful. He can do anything. And Prabhupada also said that he can change night into day and day into night. Try to figure that one out. So God, there's nothing God can't do because God means all powerful. And it's inconceivable why our position, how the Lord can do everything, but that's that's what it means to be the Supreme One. He is omnipotent. There's nothing he can't do. So a question came from the Mensa Society. Um, Swami D, can God create a rock he can't live? Think about that one. Can God create a rock he can't live? So if you say yes, you uh, you minimize his lifting power. And if you say no, you destroy his creative power. Trick question. So don't try to trick the spiritual master. <laughs> <laughs> so Prabhupada said yes. He can create a rock, he can't lift, and then he'll lift it. <laughs> so, of course, the, the question was meant to stump to a but he was explaining that, yeah, ultimately, not in, Krishna is so powerful, he can do anything. And Dilla Prabhupada taught us what it meant to be a devotee of Krishna. That meant to be a devotee of Krishna means that just to have that position is glorious. To be a devotee of the Supreme Personality of God. I mean, by nature, that is our position. We are all uh, We're all devotees or servants of the Supreme Personality of God. But to be actively engaged in that occupation of what we say, serving the Lord is a rare opportunity. And it's rarely done. Very few people take up Krishna consciousness. Taking up Krishna consciousness means to make Krishna the number one aspect of your life. In other words, Krishna Matta, Krishna Pita, Krishna Dhamma. Krishna, everything I, Everything I need, everything I want, everything I have, either belongs to him or I depend on him. And everything. That way, one lives simply under the care of the Supreme Lord. And one serves the Lord in that need. And that's what Srila Prabhupada and the Vaishnava Jacharya is like teaching us that Krishna is everything. Krishna is everything. And coming to that consciousness means actually, or it means that one has understood him, really, that Krishna is everything. And for most of us, we kind of divide our life. And there's some time for Krishna, but there's some time for me. And that's so that is acceptable to the point that. Whatever we do outside of our worship of the Supreme Lord also is, and it, it should be done in connection to the Supreme Lord. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Yat Karosi Adanasi Yat Jahosi Dadasi Yat Tapasi Bhakoti Yat Tapkuru Shambharatana. All that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer, all, all sacrifices you perform, everything should be done as an offering to me. Because when we understand the reality of existence, we understand everything, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, 
Ben Procrediastida, Earth, Water, Fire, Air, Aries, and Mind Intelligence, and Fog Vida. They're all my material energies. And combined together, they make up the material energy and in different proportions. So actually, Krishna creates the foundation by which everything exists in the material world. So ultimately, the creator is the owner. And he's most, of, in this case, both the owner and the supplier. But he allows us to take what we need in order to live in this material world. But to understand that ultimately it belongs to them. And to use it, just like in a family, the parents provide for the children. But maybe the children can't really contribute anything. But because the parents are there, they provide everything to the, to the children. And the children... Take advantage of that and they use whatever they need to grow to live their life. But it is coming from the parents. This is just an example. But it applies ultimately to our relationship to Krishna. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Savasita Hamridi Sari Pisto Matas Vita Matas Apohamucha Gyanas. That if you want remembrance, it comes from me. If you want forgetfulness, I help you. And if you want to, if you want knowledge, that is also coming from me. So everything is coming from God. It's the only thing we have is desire. He gives us uh, our our choice on how we can desire, and based on our desire, we bring either the material energy or the spiritual energy. So, if we desire materially, we bring that type of energy towards us according to the nature of that desire, and with those three categories: goodness, passion, and ignorance, which makes up the material energy. But when we desire Krishna, then we get under the control of what is called Daivi Shakti, the spiritual energy, and then we are free from the influence of the material energy. And being free from the influence of the material energy means to be free. Because we only have two options in life. We either go for the material or the spiritual. We try to combine sometimes a little bit of material here and some spiritual there. That. But that means being under the under the influence of the material energy means you have to work under those laws. And under those laws means there's restrictions. And there are also, there are also reverses. Material energy is called, um, is precarious. It is uh, unsteady. It never moves in the same direction. It's always changing. So we can't really depend on the material energy because it is always changing. Sometimes the mode of goodness is prominent. Sometimes the mode of passion. The Bhagavad Gita explains the mode of always fighting for supremacy. So according to the nature of our desire, we connect with one particular mode and we get a particular result. So we don't really do anything. We're thinking we're doing something. Oh, I'm working, I'm doing this, I'm planning like this. But that's just an illusion. Actually, we're simply desiring and we're moving the energy according to that desire. And according to that, that movement of the energy, we get a particular result based on our desire, which is formulated by our activity. But ultimately, if, the, if, if, we, were the, if we were in control, then everything would work according to what we, the way we planned, right? <laughs> And that's life in the material world, right? Everybody is just waiting for that day. All of my desires will be filled. Yeah? I'm still waiting. Right? That's material life. It never happens because all, everything works under the control of the higher powers. So happiness or success in life means to put yourself under the diving of the spiritual energy. And serve the Supreme Personality of God. And that's where Srila Prabhupada came to teach. And he taught in so many different ways through philosophy, through his personal example, and through the uh, through the examples of others also. That spiritual life is life. Material life is just a movement of the spirit behind a shadow. It's more like 
and the shadow reflects the, the, the image of the person, some material light is reflecting the reality of the spirit. Therefore, it has no substance to it. That's why no one can be happy in this world. It's not possible because it has no substance to it. It's always changing. And it's based on the external movement of the material energy, which is simply the mind and the senses connecting with the objects. The real happiness is coming from Brahma Sokyam, which is that happiness that comes by nature of our our intrinsic quality, which is spiritual. We are all spiritual by nature. And we have a material body, but that is secondary at best. And so the happiness we're looking for is only on the spiritual path. You cannot be found on the material path. So this is this was what Chila Prabhupada has written. And he's written so many books. And he's taught his, his, his philosophy practically and also how to gain the results of the activities. And so Prabhupada spent so much time, energy, and let me say resources to spread this movement. And he writes, it wasn't easy. <laughs> he said, I had to walk through fire. I didn't look left. I didn't look right. I looked straight ahead. I was walking through fire. He said, now, when he first came to this country, even people would ask him, well, Swamiji, why would you come here? And he would say, I would come here to teach you what you forgot. And then he then he would try to then he would he would speak about eventually he didn't speak about it at the beginning. He said, and in order to do that, you have to follow some rules. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no meeting, no gambling. But Prabhupada was talking one time about how one of his godfathers went to London. And uh, this, and then he met a very important man in London. He was a famous um, Lord Jetland. And Lord Jetland has spent some time in India during the British War. So he got a chance to meet Prabhupada's godfather, and they were talking. And Lord Jetler was quite respectful. And he said to Prabhupada's godfather, can you make me a Brahmana? And he said, yes. Oh, what do I have to do? Well, you simply follow these four rules, restrictions, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, no gambling. And he, Lord Jettler responded, impossible. <laughs> this is our life. <laughs> but Prabhupada said, when I came to the West, I was trying to get something impossible. <laughs> well, let me try on you. <clears throat> let me try on you. So a few people came for it. And Prabhupada was successful because he simply depended on Krishna. He didn't change anything that was given to him from the previous spiritual teachers or the scriptures he presented it as it is and bhagavad gita well, has been in the world for thousands and thousands of years ever since krishna appeared uh, about more than five thousand years ago but Prabhupada said how many people outside of india Actually, and, and Bhagavad Gita was around the world in different places. Um, and that one famous yogi who came from um, India in 1993, the world father of religion. What was his name? <laughs> Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda, yeah. He was also talking about Bhagavad Gita. But Prabhupada said, for years, Bhagavad Gita has been in the Western world, but who actually became a demonic? Nobody. So only when we presented Bhagavad Gita as it is, as Krishna intended it for us to understand, only then did, did people actually understand what is the true meaning of Bhagavad Gita. There are, when Prabhupada was here, he said there were 660 seven editions of Bhagavad Gita. 
but nobody has touched the actual Bhagavad Gita. It's using Bhagavad Gita as I see it. <laughs> so, but when Prabhupada came, he said, This is what Krishna says, you're a rascal, son. <laughs> but people didn't like that. But Prabhupada said, This is what Krishna says. Anyway, he surrendered them in Sarvadharma Purit, says, Yam Mame comes, says, Yam Mame Yam Maham Tom, Sarvapak, and your milk, says, Yam Mame, Smarsi Chan. Give up, give up all your ideas on how you can be spiritually advanced and just depend on me, surrender to me. I'll take care of you. Don't worry, don't hesitate. Um, but after Krishna spoke that, Krishna thought I made it too difficult. <laughs> Nobody's coming. Hardly on maybe a few. But then Lord Chaitanya came. Lord Chaitanya said, Don't worry about the surrender. Just chant Hare Krishna. And uh, you know, follow these simple rules and chant the holy names of the Lord. Dance when you feel happy and take nice vegetarian foods offered to the Lord in devotion. You follow that process and live your life according to the simple principles that are given in the Bhagavad Gita. And and to qualify yourself to return to the spiritual world. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu made it easy. He made it easy. And he gave it to everyone and anyone. You see, when Srila Prabhupada came, who did he preach to? It wasn't the big people who had positions in society, it was the Nippies on the Bowery. People who were considered down and out by material standards. These are the people that came forward. And they took it seriously. They changed their life. <clears throat> and Prabhupada was really a proud. Some one time Prabhupada was sitting with his, some of his disciples, this was later. And someone said, Swamiji, can you show us some mystic power? You know, people want that. You know, some magic. You know, that one yogi you go like this. Or Askuma, <laughs> or a pile of ashes, <laughs> or some gold. This is this is uh, this is mystic power. This is something that is there. You can learn the science. It's mentioned. And Prabhupada, when he was asked that question about mystic, can you give it? Prabhupada pointed to his disciples. He said, "This is my mystic power." They were all, you know, woman mongers, drunkards, drug addicts. Now they're free from all this, they're chanting Hare Krishna and they're developing all the same. Yeah. Yeah. And Prabhupada did a miracle, really. And when Prabhupada came to the West, his god brothers criticized him. You'll never be able to give these malachis, this, this great science of devotion. And I, they're too far gone. But Prabhupada understood Lord Chaitanya, and then Lord Chaitanya said, it's mentioned every town and village. And the scriptures have mentioned that Lord Chaitanya's movement will go to every town and village. But how did they interpret that? They were thinking every town and village in India. But Prabhupada, no, no, it was every town and village around the world. That was the idea. So knowing the prediction and always knowing the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, Lord Srila Prabhupada preached very strongly the message of Krishna consciousness. And he emphasized the importance of chanting Hare Krishna. Because it's mentioned uh, that out of all the practices in devotional service, Krishna Varna, Tosa, Krishna, Sangapanga, Saparshita, the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is the means by which one can free themselves from all of the turmoil that comes by way of material interaction and ultimately attain to the pure state of consciousness. Simply by this chanting of Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. It's powerful. It's coming from the Vedas, but it's not only coming from the Vedas, it's coming from the spiritual world. Golokera, Prima Dana, Arinam, Sankirtan, Ratin Jan Nino, Pena Uka Upai. 
that this mantra of the chanting of the holy name is not something of this world. It's coming from the holy, from the spiritual world directly into the hearts of the great devotees, and then they take it and spread it and give it to all of us. <coughs> So this chanting is the essence of this practice of spiritual life. And Srila Prabhupada spread it all around the world. There was one dialogue between Srila Prabhupada's godbrother, Krishnadad Babaji Maharaj. But he, he was chanting all the time. He would carry a Madonna with him. If he wasn't chanting Japa, he would be all the time. He was constantly chanting the Hare Krishna Mahārāja. So he became really close to Śrīla Prabhupāda. Prabhupāda loved him a lot. So one time, he was talking to another god-brother who also came to the West, and he said to that god-brother, you know, Swamiji, Bhaktivedanta, he went to the West. And you also, you went to the West. And he, he was a great, he's also a good scholar of the Vedas. And you also, you know the Vedas quite well. He, you failed and he succeeded. Why? It's a rhetorical statement, kind of a challenging. And this, this God brother didn't have an answer. But then Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj gave the an answer because Bhakti Vedanta had full faith in the Holy Name. Okay. That, was oh, that was the secret. He knew by spreading the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra everywhere, this would bring a cultural revolution in the minds of everyone, a spiritual revolution. And that was Prabhupada's success. I should see. He should be sure and so this is what Prabhupada came to give us the activities of the spiritual world so we must take advantage of it because life is short especially in Kali Yuka. it's not only short it's very short and the way we live now it's become shorter <laughs> we've created more ways to shorten our life <laughs> Bad air, bad food, bad sound vibrations, and scientists. Oh. <laughs> that requires a little explanation, but later on you can ask me the questions and I'll give you the answers. <laughs> so, uh, Taylor Prabhupada, again, I want to make the point that he is not an ordinary personality. And Prabhupada was very personal. He was always with his devotees. And he, 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 gave, he gave people so much of his time. His door was always open. Anyone who wanted to come to see him, if he was available, he was always talking, meeting people, traveling around the world, translating the, the Vedic scriptures, writing his bhakti that out to purports, opening up temples, meeting, uh, making devotees. Prabhupada's mission was in 1949, he wrote a thing called the Gita Nargari concept. And in that Gita Nargari concept, he established his ideas of what he wanted to do in the West. And that was four things. To spread the holy name, to spread, to translate the Vedic scriptures and, and distribute these books to open temples and to educate people to the point where they can take initiation and become medically qualified, along with establishing a society of simple living based on the culture that Krishna taught, farm communities and Vanashram. This is this is the sum total of all of Prabhupada's programs for the what it's called the re-spiritualization of the whole. Prabhupada has, Prabhupada has a big mission. He says he, he wants the whole world to be Christian followers. He's not interested in followers. He's not interested in prestige. He's interested in giving what Krishna wants to the world. That is to make everyone a follower of the Supreme Personality of God. 
and he understood the secret lies in India. Western society is just like they asked Mahatma Gandhi, what do you think of Western culture? He, th he thinks, well, Gandhi responded, I think it's a good idea. That means they, they should develop culture. <laughs> There's no culture here. What is the culture? Money. Money is the honey. <laughs> And wherever there's honey, there's bees. <laughs> so this Western culture, which is all around the world, simply proliferates itself on the idea of money, position, power. Um, in other words, if you got money, get money. That's the first thing. If you got money, you can do things and you can go places. You can you can influence things. But money is not a foundation for culture. Culture is actually character based on spiritual and aesthetic and moral values that people live according to. And Prabhupada wanted to reestablish that. So he said that we have to reestablish the Vedic culture, simple living, Krishna consciousness, Brahminical culture, and it included cow protection, but cow care also in that. Which is the foundation for a, a wholesome culture, not car care, but cow <laughs> care. <laughs> I mean, cars are useful, but we have so many problems because of it. <laughs> so, yeah, but if you have cows, there's no problems. The only problem is how to take care of them. They give you so much. I was just I was giving a class, but we were talking about cows. I'm sure many of you have lived in India before you came to this place. <laughs> and uh, cows were a very big part of people's life, in many of the villages and even in personal homes. But we were talking about cows. And one devotee who had been in India, I was talking, this was in, this was in uh, North Carolina, it was in Charlotte. And I was talking about the benefits of cows. And he said, Maharaj, you know what's interesting? He said, if someone in the family, they have a cow, someone in the family gets sick, someone in the family will go over to the cow and whisper in the cow's ear that this person is sick. And this cow will go and look for the, the herb or in nature and eat that herb. And then I'll milk the cow and give that milk, and that'll be the medicine for that. Amazing. But then another person said, It's not like that, Marge. It's not, you don't even have to tell the cow. The cow knows when they're sick. <laughs> <laughs> they're very perceptive. <laughs> and she'll go automatically and eat that herb and then, like that. So, yeah. So, um, we have given up this more or less natural lifestyle or a, a lifestyle of a lot of turmoil. So Prabhupada also wanted to reestablish a more simple lifestyle amongst the devotees and amongst people in general, because he saw that was conducive to, to not only to, to material success, but also to a spiritual uplift. Simple living, God consciousness. For medical culture, worship of the Supreme Personality of God, like that. So, Prabhupada, if you read Prabhupada's books, you should, and hear from Srila Prabhupada, he covered every subject matter on the side. Everything, any aspect of life you want to know about, you can find it in Prabhupada's teachings, his words, his books. Or in his conversations with the devotees who cover it better. Because he came to make a change in the whole scheme of people's life and bring people back to a more natural lifestyle, which is based on keeping Krishna in the center. Because Krishna is the center. You can't push him out of the center. If you push him out of the center, you push yourself out. <laughs> because he is the center. There's no but this is what we live. We live in this idea that God is useful if he can help us in our material life. Otherwise, we have this is only 
But that's not the position of the Supreme Lord. He is the worshipful object of all living things because we have an eternal loving relationship with him that can never be lost. It can only be forgotten. And keeping that foremost means to keep it to to keep one's own success in life foremost. Our success in life is our relationship with Krishna. That is our, and that's what Sri Prabhupada was teaching. So these are a few things that we can learn. And Prabhupada was the way he did things, how he also cared for his devotees. When his devotees got sick, Prabhupada would even prescribe medicine for his devotees. He would take time and see the devotees give him, because Prabhupada knew medicine. One time when Prabhupada was in Mayapur, he was, it was Guru Puja, and all the devotees were chanting Kirtan. Prabhupada was there receiving the worship, and the devotees were coming up and offering flowers to Prabhupada. Prabhupada was accepting the worship, and then one devotee came up, and he had a cut in his leg, and Prabhupada noticed the cut, and he called him over. He said, you, are you taking care of that? Oh, yes, Prabhupada, but he can, Prabhupada can understand, he was just saying that. The Prabhupada turned to his secretary and said, he said, give me a pencil, paper. And he wrote down a medicine. This is during the Guru Puja. <laughs> <laughs> He's being worshipped. They're singing his glories. He's writing a medicine for one of his disciples. And he says, here, get this medicine. And he handed him the paper. So yes, the Prabhupada was very personal. Not only was he a great, powerful spiritual master, he was like a father to all his devotees. Yeah, he he was everything to everybody. So uh, a very rare personality, as one person said, one in ten million. But I think even that is too much. More like one to one in ten billion. Uh, but was such a special personality who came to do this work. And it wasn't easy. And it wasn't easy because he had to work against the whole scheme of Western society and wake, awaken people to who they actually are. And But he knew how to do it, and that was Lord Chaitanya's mission. Chaitanya Krishna Mahamantra. Kirtan, Japa, and when you feel happy, dance. And if you don't feel happy, dance anyway. <laughs> because if you do, you feel happy. <laughs> it works. <laughs> and then he said, take nice vegetarian foodstuffs that are healthy and also spiritually uplifting. So this is our movement, chant, dance, and eat. <laughs> and read some books. But what the most important thing is that what we have as far as the value that we have in each other, the more we come together as a group, we have our personal families and we make we usually use that at the center of our life. But ultimately the real family is the spiritual family. Because we all have the same goal in mind and we all have the same need to evolve in Krishna. So when we come together, together and, and have programs together, discuss Krishna consciousness together, support each other in the spiritual way, and also in the material way also, not just spiritual. And then we find that life becomes so wonderful. We live in this Western society in a what is called an artificial lifestyle, called the nuclear family. The nuclear family, mother, father, a couple of kids in one box called a house. <laughs> but actually, society, if you take it back to Oxford culture, people live more communally. Sometimes they call it in India the extended family. But communally, in that way, people would share resources, share labor, and work together as a, as a unit to fulfill their needs. So that was what Prabhupada wanted to start was to create a spiritual family. Devotees would come together, not only in the spiritual way, but also in the material way to support each other's needs. And Just like raising children, it's not easy, right? Western, Western society. 
what does it say in the scriptures? It says, it says to raise a child, it takes a village. It takes a village to raise a child. And then the, the child has many mothers, many fathers, many caretakers. The child grows up in a very more holistic way. And now we have to, if we don't have time or working, we send the child to daycare centers and we send them to these schools. And they learn so many wonderful things in school. How to use bad language. Uh, how to, I was with him, I had one, she's, she lives here in Reading. And maybe you know her, her name is Pray Kishori, my disciple. I was at her house, and she, she has a son, he's about 13 or 14 years old. Her daughter is about nine or 10. I was talking to the boy. He was telling me, I was asking him about what school like. He said, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> he said, many of the kids, they come to school, and they, you know, they use bad language with the teachers, and they always fight. And he said, many times... They go into the bathrooms and they steal the sinks and the toilets. They actually <laughs> unscrew them and take them home. This is what he told me. I said, "This is this is education." <laughs> I couldn't believe it. He said, "This is where and you know around the world these these uh, in schools." Maybe some of you have some personal experience. <laughs> But yeah, it's it's a soul killing civilization. The kids don't get education; they just get they get knowledge of the stuff that they don't really need. Now, who cares about George Washington? What is that going to help? <laughs> he was not such a great personality anyway. He, he, he died of syphilis, venereal disease. <laughs> so, so you know what we learn in school is useless. Real education is Brahma. What is it called? Brahma so okay. No, that's Brahma. Uh, uh, Vidya. Brahma Vidya. Yeah. The knowledge of spirit. Now, of course, material knowledge has a basis also and has some foundation. But unless we, we educate our children in spirituality, and then we'll find that they'll uh, always have so many problems in life, trying to grow up in this society, struggling. So that, that education is there within community. It's like Prabhupada's style of school cool all over the world. Places where children can actually get education, both material, learning about, you know, basic things like mathematics and, like, and uh, you know, agriculture, geology, and all of that. But the, the essence is, who am I? What is my goal of life? There's a statistic. This is a, a statistic here in the, in the United States that when you test the IQ of a child when they're about three or four years old, it's very high. But after they go to school for <laughs> 20 years, no, no, 10 years, 15 years, their IQ drops. <laughs> You become stupid. <laughs> going to school. Yeah. You know, all you learn how to do is steal toilets. <laughs> and how to, you know, how to, I don't know what they learned in school. I'm not sure. I don't even know because it's not really important. <laughs> the essence is that we need to understand that our children are the future of not only of our, of our livelihood, but of the world in general. It's our duty to give them the opportunity to practice spiritual life. And there's where community comes together. So if we come together more as devotees and work together both in the spiritual and material way, we can, we can fulfill all of our needs in a more holistic environment. And that's a whole other subject. I'm just speaking about the general principle. But the details are also there. It's also known. You just have to put it in. But the essence is community, not this nuclear family where everybody has a car, everybody has a cell phone, everybody has a TV, everybody has everything. That's that's meant. That's done intentionally in order to get everyone to buy the rich products that they sell on the market. 
maybe maybe many of you know they study your spending power through advertising and they they know what you what you buy and therefore they always send you these these advertisements of the same stuff to get you buy more of the same thing so the whole idea is to get all your money <laughs> through selling your products you don't need that it was considered to be necessary based on a lifestyle that is artificial. That is the that is today's world, and therefore people are simply struggling. And the more money you make, the more to take. It's a fact. I, I preached in the UK, and the people were telling me forty five percent of the gross income that people get from their paycheck goes to taxes, even before they don't even see it. In other words. They get 55% of what the, the gross income is. And if you make over 100 pounds, 100,000 pounds a year, it's 50%. So you're out to get all your money <laughs> and create it, get it by helping you spend things that you don't really need. So a more communal type lifestyle allows us to share resources and share labor and share the abilities that we have a community of doctors a community of uh, you know, people who have different abilities that can be shared within the community and everyone can help each other and that's devotional service that's devotion so that's that's a big plan but ultimately it's the plan that is required in order for people to continue in this western civilization because things are getting difficult but that was Hila Prabhupada's plan and he said in 1973 he said this is on record and he said in 50 years this whole western civilization will collapse so 50 years is 2023 <laughs> that's what he said yeah it's, it's on record um you can listen to it this, uh, you have to find that video. Actually, I have it. We published a book I, called Krishna's Way Natural Living. Uh, I made it available to the devotees in Harrisburg. And then there, and then there's a QR code. And if you scan your phone on the QR code, you can hear Sri Prabhupada speaking about that. And he talks about the basis of how to live in a more simple environment and depend on nature, depend on God. Everything is there. Uh, but this is a transition stage back to what is normal. It's not something that we have to recreate. It's something we have to go back to. But we're stuck. We're stuck into this particular civilization. We're plugged into it. How to make that transition? It's happening slowly, but, but it is happening. It's a fact. So that's Prabhupada's movement. He said, I wanted to make a complete overhaul of the whole society, bring it back to Krishna's way, natural living, God consciousness. Hare Krishna. There's so much we could speak about, Srinivas, what he did, how he did it. It was miraculous. But he was. He came to do it on, the, on behalf of the Lord, and he was successful. Any questions or comments? Anything? <clears throat> so thank you, Maharaj, for a wonderful uh, class and reminding us of the glories of Srila Prabhupada. So, uh, if we have to serve Srila Prabhupada's mission and vision, we need to feel connected with him. So what are the ways we can read his books? When he when he was asked, Srila Prabhupada, how can we associate you with one of your God? He said, read my books. He said, I'm in my books. Everything you need to know is in the books. And his books are not simply philosophy it's his personal realization on his relationship with krishna 
They're very, they're both philosophically and very personally connected to Shri Prabhupada. Now, when you read his books, you can actually connect with him. Can I tell you a little personal story? Yes, you can. You want to hear? Yes. I, I don't want to sound like I, I'm special, but <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was in Chicago. I lived in Austin in the Chicago Temple for about 17 years now. And one day I was in my room. This was back in the 1990s. And I was reading Srimad Bhagavatam, just reading, reading for a long time. I must have been reading almost two hours. And at one point, um, the whole thing changed. I wasn't reading the words anymore. I was hearing the words. I heard, I started to hear Srila Prabhupada's voice speaking the words as I was reading them. It was like listening to a tape. Mm -hmm. And it went on for some time. And I was amazed. As I was reading, I was hearing his voice speak the words I was reading. It went on for quite a while. And then after maybe 10 minutes or so, it stopped. And I think Prabhupada said, I'm in my books, I told you. <laughs> I'm here personally. So we can actually connect. That's that, that was an experience. But we can actually connect with Sri Prabhupada because his connection is through what he gave us. His, his personal guidance and his and the knowledge of Krishna and devotional service. Everything is there. When you read the books, especially Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, he probably said four books are the most important. Chaitanya Charitamrita, Srimad Bhagavatam, like the devotion, and uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita, can I say that Bhagavad Gita? He's four. Bhagavad Gita, like the devotion, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita. He said these four books have everything you need. And you can't exhaust them even in the sunlight. Mm -hmm. So much knowledge is there. But yeah, if we take time to read these books, bring your family together and invite a few friends and sit together and read. And then to discuss it, discuss what you need. Try to understand deeper what is being said. Anything else? Did I scare everybody? Okay, thank you. 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 Thank you.